Welcome back to the Institute of East Asia Training. I am happy to be back to home in Dunlap, Tennessee, where it's a little easier to get recording done, so I'll be catching up today. And uh, sorry I got behind. I've been traveling a lot. Anyway, let me have a prayer with you, then we'll get to Revelation uh, chapter 11, which will be lecture number 12. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I'm asking you to bless our time here. Teach us what is right and true. And I ask for that gift in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Uh, so first we want to have a quiz. This quiz is on that lecture that we just gave recently on uh, dealing with futurism and futuristic ideas. So that first question, these are all going to be hard questions, comparatively hard. Hope you don't mind. Question one. The fifth trumpet mentions the seal of God. Is this evidence of an end-time fulfillment of the trumpets? Why or why not? So right there in the fifth trumpet, you have that mention of the seal of God. I'm asking, is that evidence of an end-time fulfillment? And You can just give me an answer, and not just yes or no, but why do you think so, why not? Question two. In Revelation, we observed that the world has followed the beast. That's past tense in verse 3, but it will follow the beast. That's future tense in verse 8. What do we gather from this progression of tenses? So if in verse 3, it's still future. I mean, excuse me, if in verse 3, it's past already, but in verse 8, it's still future. What do we gather from that? Give me some ideas what we can learn or what, what you might think about that. Question 3. In Revelation 10, we find the seven thunders. You might remember that uh, John heard the seven thunders. He was told not to write them. And uh, so we find them there. Why is it that Ellen White speaks of these seven thunders, both in future tense and in past tense? If you go through Ellen White's uh, comments on those seven thunders, you'll find a couple paragraphs where she's speaking about them as future and a couple where she speaks about them as if they're past. And hey, those comments were written about the same time. So what do we gather from that? And then question four. In Revelation, what do the symbols of grass and trees seem to represent? You got grass and trees there in Revelation 7, and again in Revelation chapter 8, and Revelation chapter 9. What do the green grass and trees seem to represent in these prophecies of the seals and the trumpets. Okay, well, you're ready for the lecture. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, technically we're not really done with uh, the parenthetical part of the prophecy. Revelation chapter 10, which described the Advent movement, and we studied that already two lectures ago, Give me a moment. I'm having a hard time getting to it in my Bible here. There we are. Revelation 10 discussed the Advent movement. And if you look at the very end of chapter 10, you'll see where he says, And he said to me, You must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So there's a prediction about the, the shut door theory that there's no more salvation for sinners, and God's saying no. You need to still give the gospel. You need to give that first angel's message still to the world. But when you look at chapter 8, I mean, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 1, it doesn't look like a new prophecy. Uh, let's just read on what it says there. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel, that must be the same angel from chapter 10, and the angel stood saying, Rise, measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread down the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. Quite an interesting picture. I'm going to tell you, well, maybe I'll show you before I tell you. Keep a finger here or a ribbon or something, but turn with me to Luke chapter 24 and verse 21. Luke, you know what? It's 21, 24. Luke 21 and verse 24. 
I think I don't have dyslexia, but I must have something somewhat related to it. Luke 21, verse 24. It's, this is part of that sermon on what they call, uh, not the Sermon on the Mount, but uh, the same sermon from Matthew 24 and Mark 13 is right here in Luke 21. The sermon dis that discussed the destruction of Jerusalem and the signs of the end. Uh, the Olivet Discourse, that's the phrase I was looking for. Look at verse 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. If you compare this idea to Mark and Matthew, you'd find that this is referring to the persecution of the Dark Ages, that period when Christians were being killed by professed Christians. And notice what it says here. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That verse was so interesting to the Adventist preachers, the evangelist of uh, yesterday, I mean a, a few decades ago. When they read this, they saw that in the Bible, various groups of people have cups of iniquity, and those cups fill up. So the Amalekites, the Amalekites have a cup of iniquity, and when that cup gets to the top, judgments happen to the Amalekites. And uh, the same would go for the Hittites and for so many other groups of people, for the Assyrians and for the Babylonians. So those Adventist evangelists, when they read about this times of the Gentiles, they were thinking that would be the time when probation closes for the Gentiles. And if that's when probation closes for the Gentiles, well, the Gentiles is almost the whole planet. That's when probation closes for planet Earth. So they concluded that Jerusalem, the city Jerusalem, would never again be controlled by Jews until the close of probation. Because it says right there in verse 24, Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So back in the 1930s and the early 1940s, when there was a lot of talk about the Jews going back to Jerusalem, so much talk about it, the Adventist evangelists were using this to attract people to the meetings, and they would put up their banners, about, will the Jews go back, will Jerusalem be rebuilt, and they were championing the championing championing, I don't know how to say that word, but they were making a real message out of this idea that Jerusalem will never be controlled by the Jews, never become again the capital of the Jews. Well, of course, there in the 40s, I think it was 46, and then more thoroughly in the 60s, Jerusalem did become the capital of Israel. And those Adventists were embarrassed. And we suddenly became very quiet about the topic, and we haven't been talking about it much since. And and uh, one guy, Grothier, he just went to the conclusion that probation did close back in the 60s when the war was won against the Jews. I mean, the war against the Jews was won by the Jews. And uh, well, what I want to show you today is that this Jerusalem being trampled by the Gentiles in Luke 21 is the exact same idea that we see in Revelation 11. We just read it there about the Jerusalem being trampled by the Gentiles. And if you compare it to Matthew 24 and Mark 13, you can see that what, what Jesus calls Jerusalem here in Luke is the same thing as God's people, the church, in Matthew and Mark. And that what he calls Gent Gentiles here in Luke is the same as the enemies of God's people in Matthew and Mark. Let me just say this simply, and then we'll go back to Revelation. Jesus spoke about the 1260 years of the Middle Age papal supremacy, sometimes quite literally and sometimes quite symbolically. And when he talked about Jews and Gentiles, that was symbolic. He was saying those who don't have the heart born again, those are spiritual Gentiles. And those that are born again, those are the spiritual Jews. So turn back to Revelation Revelation chapter 11, 
and we're going to look at what that really does mean there. Revelation 11. I'm going to tell you that just as John represented the church in chapter 10, here he represents what's being done to the church. What's being done to the church is that the church is being evaluated. That measuring represents the investigative judgment. But not everyone is being evaluated in the investigative judgment. It's not everyone. It's those that have entered the service of God, those who've confessed their sins, those who have died for their faith. Uh, what it says there is the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Those are the ones who are evaluated in the judgment. But those who've never entered the service of God, that's represented by the courtyard, the judgment isn't really for them. Because the judgment is to evaluate the claims of those who said that they're following morality. They're living by moral principles. They're following the Messiah. And, uh, and that's why it says in verse 2 that those, that the outside of God's church, the courtyard, as it were, the churches that aren't keeping his commandments, those are going to be controlled by those pagan forces all the way until the end of the 1260 days, that is, until 1798. <clears throat> so I'm going to go on now to verse 3. And it says here, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. The two witnesses. Well, first, observe this, that the 42 months of verse 2 looks like the 1260 days of verse 3. And if you put those together, 1260 divided by 42, you get 30. 1260 divided by 42 equals 30. And that tells us that when we're looking at time prophecies in the book of Daniel and Revelation, and we see a year, that we can safely read that as 1260, excuse me, as 360 days. Because that's 12 months of 30 days each. That's the way prophecy is dealing with this, this issue of 29 and a half days and 12 and 13 months variable. It's just making it simple for us. 30 day months, 360 day years. But what about these two witnesses? We're going to find here, let's just read it and then we'll see we'll find that this metaphor is drawn from Zechariah. And these two olive trees, this is verse 4, and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. I think I skipped a word, are. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, Fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. Remember, that happened with Elijah. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. Remember, Elijah did that for three and a half years. And they have power over water to turn them to blood. Remember, Moses did that. And to strike the earth with all plagues. That's what Moses did. As often as they desire. So we're going to look at this. Two witnesses, two olive trees, two lampstands. They're all the same thing. This metaphor is drawn from Zechariah. Let's turn there right now. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4, and I'm putting my ribbon back here to get back to it quickly. Zechariah chapter 4, looking at verse... Uh, two. And he, the angel, said to me, What do you see? So I said, I am looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on the top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. So here is Zachariah looking. We'll call him Zach. And Zach sees a golden lampstand, like a candelabra, seven different uh, lights coming out 
and a bowl for collecting and holding the oil that keeps them all burning. Verse 3, two olive trees are by it, one on the right hand of the bowl and the other on the left. So here's the golden lampstand. It has a bowl for oil. But where's the oil coming from? It's coming from two olive trees that are on either side. And those olive trees, they have a way of feeding oil directly into that lamp so it can shine. Verse 4, So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Remember, there was the oil coming to that golden lamp that lit up so much. The word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not really a hard idea. Here Zerubbabel is pictured as a bright light, but he's not a bright light by himself. It's not that he's powerful. He needs the power of the spirit inside of him, that holy oil. And that holy oil is coming from those two trees, those two witnesses. But it really doesn't tell us what those two witnesses are until you analyze what the angel said. Look back at verse 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. You see, Zerubbabel is filled with the Spirit, but that comes via the word of God. The word of God to Zerubbabel is what fills him with power. The word of God to Zerubbabel is what gives him light. That word is a light to him and makes him to be a light. When you understand the simple idea of Zechariah 4, it's not hard to go back now, and you should do it, to Revelation chapter 10 and understand the, or chapter 11 and understand the metaphors. Revelation chapter 11, you have these two olive trees, the two lampstands standing before the God of all the earth. What are these? This is the word of God. But not the word of God to Zerubbabel. It's the word of God to the church. The word of God to the church, it's coming. It's represented as two witnesses, two olive trees, sending in their, their golden oil to fill us with the Spirit. If you divide the word of God into two parts, what might you call those two parts? Well, since you live in 2021 or whatever year you might watch this, you might do it the way that Bible translators have done it. Uh, you know, I, I, it gets a little darker when I hold this up, doesn't it? You might do it by saying the Old and the New Testament. Okay, I don't mind that. You can call it the Old and the New Testament. The key thing is that it's the Word of God to Zerubbabel. It's the Word of God to us. God's Word to the church. But when I look in the Old Testament, I see that the Word of God was divided up into two sections a little bit differently. It was divided up into the law and the prophets. And when Jesus talked about the word of God, he talked about the law and the prophets. And when I look back at Revelation 11, and I see Elijah pictured and Moses pictured, Elijah with calling down fire, uh, Moses with bringing the plagues and turning water to blood, Elijah with stopping the rain, when I see them both pictured so plainly, I think, Moses, that's the law. Elijah, that's the prophets. So you have here the picture that the law and the prophets, the Old and New Testament, the Word of God, was going to be preaching during the 1260 years, but it wasn't going to be preaching with its full power. It said clothed in sackcloth, that is, in a state of mourning or suffering, and uh, what do we find in the Middle Ages? The Word of God was rare. It was hard to find it. Uh, Luther didn't find it till he ended up in a monastery, and it was chained to the convent wall. It was hard to locate God's words. There was a famine for the Word of God. And many people lost their life for the Word of God. The book of Revelation even talks about that. Those that were killed for the testimony of Jesus for the word, that, the word that they held. 
Let's go on now in Revelation 11 and see what comes after they do their, their prophes prophesying and sackcloth. Verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, that is the 260 year period of mourning and sadness when the word of God was suppressed, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. So now we look around the end of 1790, the 1700s, the 1790s, if you will, and we see, is there a nation that rose to power in, in or around chaos, out of chaos? Well, yes, there was. We find just at that period of time an atheistic French revolution. And the rising of that atheistic French revolution, uh, it was rising to power over Europe because Napoleon represented that revolution on the battlefield and he was having victories everywhere he went until he got to Waterloo. Here's Napoleon having great successes. And right there in France, the word of God was banned and burned and mocked. And atheism became the ruling business. Yeah, just something. The ruling business. Atheism, can you imagine it? So, what it says in Revelation, verse 8, is that, well, verse 7 said they're killed. And that's what happened under the power of France. The word of God was suppressed. The teaching of it was outlawed. The people became officially an atheistic nation. The word of God was banned for three and a half years. Now look what it says in verse 8. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Uh, maybe we can explain that a little bit. You see, France was the very nation that had most persecuted God's people during the 1260 years. Jesus had been killed there in the person of his saints. And what was the effect? Now spiritually, France was like Sodom. They were just one immoral, debauched bunch of people. I mean, immorality, uh, the disillusioned of marriage and adultery. It was just an incredible immoral development right there in France. And then Egypt. Uh, Egypt, you remember that when God was trying to set his people free from Egypt, he did set them free. But Pharaoh once said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? That bald-faced denial of the authority of God was exactly represented there in France. A very plain denial. So spiritually, Sodom, immoral. Spiritually, Egypt, denying God's authority. Spiritually, where Jesus was crucified because of the persecution in the Middle Ages that happened prior to that. Look at verse 9. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days. That's 1793 to 1797. Three days and will not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. It says three and a half days, excuse me. Will not allow their dead bodies. That is, for three and a half years, much of the world, because the world had been colonized by France and by Europe, and now France was conquering Europe, so the colonized world was wondering, wondering, is this the end of Bible religion? Has reason conquered religion? Is it all over? And those who concluded that it was were so happy. I mean, there were parties. It was great to just know that there's no God. You can do what you want. Oh, people were so pleased for a very short time. Verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and then send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Yeah, that's true. The word of God is powerful and alive, and it speaks to our sins. It speaks to my sins. It tells me what I'm doing wrong, what we need to change, how to go. 
and people just don't like being told what to change. If you speak today to the LGTB uh, community and speak to them what the Word of God says, you will find that what they experience is something like the torment spoken of right here in verse 10. Just a feeling like they just wish it was gone already. Let it be. But look at verse 11. Now after three and a half days, after 1797, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. What's going on here? You see, I didn't tell you this, but when the Bible was banned, France fell into a bloodbath. The French Revolution was characterized by a reign of terror when people were killed, 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 killed. Somewhat similar to what happened in Cambodia much more recently, just except for there in France, you could be on the throne today and killed tomorrow, and the one who took your place in the throne, he'll be killed the next day. And it just was like that, just so much, until the people were ready to invite religion back and repealed the laws that banned religion. Verse 12, And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Oh, what happened there? What happened is that the international and American Bible societies were formed just after the French Revolution, within a couple years of it. They were formed and they grew, and suddenly, within a few years of the Revolution, the Word of God had spread to more nations and more languages than it had during the entire 1260 years of papal supremacy. Just the Word of God was being exalted out of its place. Voltaire, who during the Revolution boasted that one man would be sufficient to overthrow the religion of Christ that was established by twelve, his house ended up becoming, being purchased after he died and used as a, a depository for Bibles and for the business of printing and distributing them. God just triumphed over Europe and the world in this business of uh, re rejuvenating and spreading the word of God. Verse 13, in the same hour there was a great earthquake. It doesn't say after that. It's at the same time as this business. At the same time that the word of God is killed, stays in the grave, and rises. At the same time, there's an earthquake, and the tenth of the city fell. This is that great city Babylon, which represents the the Holy Roman Empire under the Roman Catholic Church, and one-tenth of it fell. You remember that there were ten horns on the beast in Daniel 7, and ten horns in Revelation. Well, we haven't got to Revelation 12 yet, have we? We're going to see them in the next chapter. Anyway, one of those ten, that is France, France fell. And in the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed. That's that reign of terror. Seven there representing uh, completeness or widespread, in this case, destruction. So yeah, an earthquake under the city destroyed the France, the French Quarter, and there was the bloody revolution. And then it says, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So that shows that when we talk about the second woe, that one that we learned about a few days ago that involved the Turkish, the Ottoman Empire's uh, conquering of much of the world, it wasn't just the Ottoman Empire conquering the world. It was also the French Revolution conquering the remainder of Europe. Between Napoleon and the Ottomans, the, the civilized world was largely put into darkness. The darkness of secularism, by France and of Islam, by Napoleon, those two things happened. The second woe is past. 
That second one was pretty bad, don't you think? Like so much of the world plunged into darkness that way. Verse 14 says, Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded. Now, do you remember the seventh angel? We heard about the seventh angel in chapter 10. That's where we read that in the days when the seventh angel will begin to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. And now finally, in chapter 11, we're finding the sounding of it. And what does it say? And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So here we have the conclusion. The conclusion of the of this 1260 years of prophecy and then of that measuring of the church and the investigative judgment that measurement is done and when it's done Jesus decides who is part of his kingdom and who isn't and he determines in heaven that's where this happens in heaven it's declared that Jesus has the right to rule it's been decided who are his and who are not He's ready to come back and to conquer his enemies. He hasn't done it yet, but it happens in heaven. This is similar to how in the parable it says that he goes into a far country and receives a kingdom and then comes again. Jesus is receiving. Right now his kingdom is being made up. Right now it's being determined who gets a passport to heaven. Who is an American citizen? No, 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 no. I don't want to compare America to the heavenly kingdom. Who is a heavenly citizen? And who is going to be kept out, uh, persons that are not welcome there? Verse 16, And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God. Everyone's going to be happy when this is over. And that could be soon. We don't know when, the, when probation is going to close and the plagues are going to start. Saying, We give thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. I'm looking forward to that, Jesus taking his great power and reigning. But that's going to start with the punishment of his enemies in the seven last plagues. The nations were angry. That could be World War I, World War II, World War III if we have it. But it's past tense now. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come. That's the seven last plagues. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. That is, the investigative judgment is over. And now it's time to execute. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. At Christ's second coming, the execution of that judgment happens, and the judgment of the wicked begins in the thousand years. And that you should destroy those who destroy the earth. Now, many people argue about the, this last part of verse 18. I think it's probably well translated. The earth is being destroyed by people, and it is your obligation and mine to recycle what we can and pick up the trash. Though my friend uh, Gary with Fulcrum 7, he would say that the word here more represents that God is going to destroy, is going to uh, ruin those who are ruining the earth, something like that, and that's not a reference to climate at all. Hey, we'll find out soon enough, but for sure, we shouldn't corrupt the earth. And we shouldn't destroy it. We're stewards morally and physically. Verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple. So spiritually, people began to see that ark when Christ entered the most holy place. But when the seven last plagues begin to fall, there's going to be a revelation from heaven of the law of God. And that law of God is going to be shown to be the authority in which God's kingdom rests. The temple of God was opened where, it says? It doesn't say in Jerusalem or in Palestine, but in heaven. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there was lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Now that, friends, is the very thing we saw at the very beginning of chapter 8. That is, we saw that Christ's ministration ends with the same, same series of events that these seven trumpets end. This is the end of the seventh trumpet. 
So if I would just say it plainly about the three woes, that first woe was the rise of Islam. The second woe was the rise of the military conquest part of Islam, and particularly the invention of artillery and cannonry and missiles. And the third, and also including the secular French Revolution that has revolutionized the world and spread atheism far and wide, but what is that third woe? Oh, it's, it's a worse experience than the first two. It's the seven last plagues falling on the planet. The seven last plagues falling on the planet. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and the Ark of His covenant was seen in the temple. And there were lightnings and noises, thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Keep your finger here, but look at Revelation 16. Because Revelation 16 has the seven last plagues that we've been talking about. And look down at the end. Revelation 16, and looking at uh, verse 18. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such, as, such a mighty and great earthquake, as had not occurred since men were on the earth. And then verse 21 and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone being about the weight of a talent. So in the French Revolution, Babylon was divided into ten pieces, and one of them fell. But in the coming seven last plagues, it's going to be divided into three, and all three parts are going to fall. What we've been saying today is that the French Revolution was a terrible development in the world. But now I want to talk to you about the about the reason. Why was it that sin was allowed to prosper for 1260 years? Why did God let the French kill his people for a millennium? What was the point of it? Well, I think if you use your thinking caps, you can get to something like an answer. France, you remember, had a 30-year head start on the persecuting of God's people. In 508, that's when France really became a tool of the, the popes. So it had a 30-year head start, and it always was advanced in this business. It was the one country where the Inquisition operated, and many crusades against God's people happened for year after year after year. Millions were killed in southern France. And then later, hundreds of thousands were banished, and the Huguenots came here to America and, and settled North and South Carolina, were largely settled by those Huguenot wanderers. So that for 1290 years, the Catholic Church had its way in France, able to banish the light, to confiscate goods, to kill the incorrigible, it, it had its ability to do what it wanted to do. And you might think, after almost 13 centuries of being able to control things, that France would have become a beautiful Catholic nation with peace and stability and practicing the principles of Catholicism in a happy family with no dissent and everyone getting along. Is that what happened? No, sir. Nothing like that at all. On the contrary, in France, Catholicism collapsed on itself. The very power that had controlled France made France into a nation that was devoid of conscience, a nation that had banished its spirituality, a nation that had no more spirit in it, and when that happened, the people, when they realized they had been oppressed by the clergy, they turned on the clergy. And in fact, in the revolution, the French Revolution, it was the priests that were some of the first to die. Some of the first heads to roll off the guillotine were priests. What I'm saying is that Catholicism is a system of Satan that ends in self-destruction. That's the message of the 1290 days. On the contrary, the word of God, which has persecuted that entire time, 
is a system that can be oppressed at the same time. Catch the idea. France is exalting Catholicism and oppressing the Word of God at the same time, and at the end of that period, France collapses on Catholicism, and the Word of God explodes with life. But right now, there's a lot of confusion in the planet. That confusion comes because of the mixing, of the, the breaking down of that barrier that Jesus established in Genesis 3, do you remember there in Genesis 3.15 where he promised to put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman? Well, that enmity has been breaking down. That enmity is uh, not doing well today at all. And consequently, you can find godly people in Buddhism godly people in Islam, godly people in Catholicism, so that you have, you can even find self-sacrificing, caring atheists. And when you find these people, it causes confusion. What you have here is a character related to the Christian principles that have been taught from the Word of God, mixed with a religion that is contrary to the Word of God. You find goodness on a foundation of rottenness. And at the same time, when you come to the Adventist faith, what you find here is a beautiful foundation, but you can find sociopaths in the church. You can find persons in the church who have molested children. You can find people who love to argue and fight in this church. It's confusion. It's confusion. It's confusing. It's confusing when you see godliness mixed with evil that makes it hard to see its character, and you see evil mixed with godliness that makes it hard to see its character. So what God has done to give vision to the universe is he allowed France to expel the truth so that the character of evil could be plainly seen in the French Revolution. And now in chapter 7 we saw the 144,000. We'll learn more about them in chapter 14 when we study about them again. But the 144,000, here's another pure group. Here's a group where you can see what righteousness looks like. You can see what holiness does. You can see the self-sacrificing nature of it. It's just beautiful. And when you can see it, your eyes will be opened. And now you can make a contrast between the darkness and the light. And then you can choose it. That this is what Jesus was doing when he was here on earth. He picked his 12 disciples, and you know, he could have had thousands. Jesus in John 6 had thousands of followers, and yet he spoke very plainly to them, truths that he knew were hard to understand. He didn't even try to explain them. He was trying, trying and succeeding at weeding out the chaff. So that at the end of chapter 6, he went from thousands to just a few, but his few were mostly pure. 11 out of 12 were real consecrated individuals. And because of that purity, people could see them. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And the contrast with the self-serving Pharisees was high. Yes, very high. So we all have things to do to eliminate our own selfishness and self-service. If someone is perplexed about why God allowed so much suffering to go on, maybe you can help them with this. That part of it was to open people's eyes so they can see the darkness of secularism, the darkness of Islam, the darkness of Hinduism and Buddhism and the darkness of Catholicism, God allows some things to happen so people can see. But for them to see very well, the shaking has to happen right in our own church. There has to be a, a sending away of those who are unfaithful. And that is going to happen. That is happening. That is happening to people I know that have been close to me. It will happen to you and happen to me if we don't hold on to principles of holiness. Let me have a prayer with you and for you and for myself. 
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for the pure sample you're going to show to the universe of faithfulness. Thank you for sending your son Jesus that we could see purity in him. Would you please develop that image in us? Allow us to represent you well on this planet. Finish the work that you've started. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.